In part one of this lecture, we're going to move on a little further from Bohr's model to give you a basic feel for where current atomic theory sits. The Bohr model of the atom, with its fixed energy levels, arranges the electrons according to a rule which says that the maximum number of electrons in each level is found by 2n squared, where n is the number of the level. So for n equals 1, the lowest energy level, the maximum number of electrons is 2 times 1 squared, which is 2. And for n equals 2, the second energy level, the maximum number is 2 times 2 times 2, which is 8, and so on. This allows us to draw diagrams like these, where we show the electrons arranged in concentric levels around the nucleus. Carbon is element 6 on the periodic table, so it has 6 electrons to be arranged. 2 fit in the lowest level, and the remaining 4 go in level number 2. So in its simplest form, the electron configuration for carbon is 2, 4. Phosphorus is element 15 on the periodic table, so it has 15 electrons to be arranged. 2 in the lowest level, a maximum of 8 in the second level, and that leaves 5 to go in the third level. So the simple electron configuration for phosphorus is 2, 8, 5. We can work backwards with this and draw diagrams for atoms from their electron configurations. For instance, nitrogen has 7 electrons and its electron configuration is 2, 5. So we can draw 2 electrons in the lowest energy level and 5 in level 2. Chlorine is element number 17, so its configuration is 2, 8, 7. 2 in level 1, 8 in level 2, and the remaining 7 in level 3. Up until now we've been working with what's called a classical model, where the electrons behave like small solid charged balls whizzing around the nucleus in their strictly defined orbits. However, in 1924, Louis de Broglie, a French PhD student who was only 22 years old at the time, revolutionised physics by developing a theory that predicted that not only light, but also matter, had wave-particle duality. That is, actual bits of matter, electrons, protons, atoms, soccer balls, even people, acted both as waves and as particles. The reason no one had noticed this is that at large scales, it's only the particle-like behaviour that's obvious. It isn't until you start dealing with very, very small particles that it becomes practical to observe wave-like behaviour. Einstein had already shown wave-particle duality with the smallest particles we know, photons, but they have no mass. It's another thing entirely to say that particles with actual mass should behave like a wave. But de Broglie predicted that with something as small as an electron, it should be possible to observe wave-like behaviour. Three years later, in 1927, this was shown experimentally. In the US, Clinton Davison and his colleague Lester Germer demonstrated it by firing a beam of electrons at a crystal of metal and observing that the particles, the electrons, produced a diffraction pattern, exactly as if they were a wave. Independently, in Aberdeen, George Thompson fired a beam of electrons through thin metal foil and showed the same thing. Now there's a beautiful symmetry in George Thompson being part of this discovery. George's father was J.J. Thompson, who had discovered the electron as a particle and came up with the plum pudding model. George, his son, subsequently showed that the electron was also a wave, thus completing the picture. De Broglie received the Nobel Prize for his theory, and Thompson and Davison and Germer all received it a few years later for their experimental confirmation of his ideas. So what effect did this development have on the model, model of the atom? If the electron is a wave, it means we can no longer treat it as a little hard sphere that might be tracked in an orbit around the nucleus. A wave is harder to pinpoint. When de Broglie's theory was published, it was taken up by Erwin Schrödinger, and along with work by Einstein and Bohr, he developed it into a new theory that described how the electron might move around the nucleus. Schrödinger described the electron's path around the nucleus not as a defined orbit, but as what he called a wave function. This is hard to imagine, but the way it's usually described is that at any point around the nucleus, there's a certain probability that the electron will be there. It's often depicted like this. The dark region around the nucleus means there is a high probability of the electron being there. The lighter region means the probability of finding the electron gets steadily lower the further from the nucleus you are. This particular picture shows the probability of finding an electron in the first energy level, the lowest energy level of an atom. 
and to distinguish it from Bohr's idea of orbits, Schrödinger instead called it an orbital. Orbitals are usually represented in one of two ways. On the left here is a diagram like that on the previous slide. The density of the dots tells you about how likely it is that you will find the electron in that region for this orbital. The black circle on the middle diagram indicates the region within which there's a 90% probability that you will find the electron at any point in time. You could think about it as the electron spending 90% uh, of its time within the circle and 10% of its time outside it. The black circle could also be represented as a sphere, as on the right here, which encloses the region of 90% probability. Orbitals are often drawn with solid looking surfaces like this because it's the easiest way to represent their shapes. But you must remember that there is no actual wall or surface. It's just a convenient way of indicating where the electron spends most of its time. OK, so how does the new regime of orbitals match up with the old electron levels? According to Schrödinger's model, each orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons, unlike the shells, the electron levels, which could hold larger numbers. So the new model states that each energy level must be divided into a number of orbitals. Level 1 could hold a maximum of two electrons, so it only has one orbital. This is known as the 1s orbital. 1 tells you the energy level, it's the first energy level, and s tells you the type of orbital. Level 2 is able to hold eight electrons, as you know. Since each orbital can only hold two electrons, that means that the second energy level must be made up of four orbitals, each holding two electrons. These four orbitals are the 2s orbital and three other orbitals called the 2p orbitals. You can see from this diagram that the three 2p orbitals have exactly the same energy as one another and that they're slightly higher in energy than the 2s orbital, which means on average they're slightly further away from the nucleus. Level 3 is able to hold 18 electrons, so it must be made up of nine orbitals. They are the 3s orbital, three 3p orbitals, which are slightly higher in energy, and five 3d orbitals, which are higher in energy again. And as you can see from the diagram, each succeeding level can hold more and more electrons because it's composed of more and more orbitals. You can see there's a pattern here too. Each level starts with an s orbital, and then it has p orbitals, and then d orbitals, and so on. The thing that all the orbitals of a particular type all of the s orbitals or all of the p orbitals, the thing that they all have in common is their geometry. It's not necessary for you to remember these shapes, but I think it's interesting to see them nonetheless. Remember that the surfaces of the shapes in this diagram just indicate the region within which the electrons in that orbital spend most of their time. So all s orbitals are spherical. As you go from 1s to 2s to 3s and so on, further energy levels that are further away from the nucleus, the size of the sphere increases, meaning the electron spends more time further away from the nucleus. The p orbitals, in contrast, are dumbbell shaped. There are always groups of three p orbitals together, and each one points in a different direction. The d orbitals are even more complicated, with combinations of dumbbells and a ring and various things. OK, that's all for part one. In part two, we're going to learn how to write the electron configurations for atoms using these new orbitals.